Welcome everybody today. Uh, maybe a few of you have been able to meet Jeff Jackson, the alfalfa and forage specialist from the Midwest. I do also have the opportunity and the pleasure of being your sorghum product manager, encompassing forage sorghum, sorghum sedans, uh, pearl millets, and all that good stuff as well. So thank you again for joining us and uh, hope you're all having a good morning so far. Um, being in a different time zone, I keep trying to remember and look down at the sheet of paper. What time is it actually for me and what time is it for you? So I hope you're all having a great day. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about sorghum pests and some management right up front. And part of this uh, slide says, what options do we have today? So just as everyone else has tried to portray as well, I uh, part of my job I feel is to help provoke some thought process, get people engaged to think maybe a different level or, or outside the box just a little bit. And sometimes it's a review and you might go, oh yeah, I need to just think about that. So as we go through this, uh, again, you're not gonna see an answer to every question you might have in this uh, 20 minute presentation. So uh, bear with me, here we go for a ride and we're gonna move along to uh, talk about some pest management in some sorghums. So a few things that you might not understand or realize technically, there are a lot of different sorghum plant pests. And I, uh, there are probably even more than what I have listed on this list. But for short conversation's sake, to get us to think about some of these things, and in part of your world, so again, as we go all the way from Arizona, New Mexico, up around the Horn, all the way to Washington, um, the use of sorghums, be it grain sorghum, forage sorghum, maybe a sorghum sit-in cross, is going to change quite a little bit going from south to north and the pests that you encounter are going to obviously change from south to north. Um, some insects are more detrimental to a grain sorghum. We're in forage sorghum. We don't worry so much about grain production from that standpoint or a sorghum sedan grass. So as, as we go through this, you're going to have some highlighted thoughts about some pests and, and really don't care about the others at all. So uh, bear with me here. But Wireworms, cutworms, ants and grubs, green bugs, chinch bugs, midge, headworm, stink bug. You got earworm. Some of the corn insects also impact some uh, development during anthesis. And then we have this bold printed underlined one down here, the yellow sugarcane aphid as well. So we're going to dive into these just a little bit. So wireworms. One of those pests that at first you really don't consider to be too big a deal, but just like in the corn production, um, they're going to be out there in those fields more at that seeding stage. Um, once that seedling germinates and gets a root established and starts growing, we don't have nearly as much trouble. But what they're going to do is they're going to get out there before that seed germinates and kind of hollow out that seed. Some of those might actually have taken off and get going. You might have a weak stand, weak seedlings, poor plants out there. Again, the length of time that seed is in the soil before they germinate has an impact on how detrimental wireworms can actually get because they're going to catch you in that seed uh, stage before it really goes anywhere. So if you make Make sure you're planting in a warm soil, 60, 65 degrees. Get that stuff going quickly. Get a good seed bed so that seedling can germinate and get going. You're going to reduce the impact of wireworms if, in fact, it happened to be in that field. So, again, some of these fields that might give you trouble in that area where you have, you know, some, some grassy plants in the past. Um, further East we go, we get into some of these CRP acres along pastures where we have these grass fence rows in different places like that. That's generally where we see most of the wireworm pressure. So again, and as this says here, some tillage uh, potentially before planting. If you're going no-till, you're going to have more trash, more residue, more organic matter, going to harbor more of those insects. So you could have a little bit more trouble and some more pressure. We do have options insecticide applied on the seed. You have planter box insecticides. Um, 
some in furrow insect application as well. So multiple options to take care of these wireworms. So that's one of the insects that we can just be cautious about, be aware of. Um, if you have some of those scenarios that are taking place, if you're gonna plant too early, maybe it's a little cool. Obviously I don't want to do that because I don't like replants on sorghum seed. Lots of organic matter, some of those no-tilled field type scenarios uh, might be a little bit of an issue. So just be conscious of those. Ants, again, you wouldn't think of an ant being problems, but again, they could chew through some of those thin seed coats. To, they get in there, remove the embryo. Rarely do they go after the starch part, but they'll get in there and take some of that, damage the uh, germination of the plant. Um, so again, they're gonna leave kind of a ragged pit hole on the side of that seed. Again, if we can get that seed to germinate and get it going really quickly, it's very important. Uh, to the same effect of the wireworm, the longer it lays there, the more chance we have for a problem with ants in a sorghum crop. So seed treated with insecticide, planter box applications again, Again, plant seed with good vigor, get it up out of the ground, get it germinated and going before those ants can take any real, real major effect on the stand. Might seem like a weird one to you as well, but grubs. You get that larvae in that soil, it's spring, soil's warming up, the larvae get active, we get things past those wireworms, we get past the ants and we're working along, then all of a sudden we have these grubs come in they're usually going to affect that stand after it gets started. We're going to get things germinated and coming out of the ground. They're gonna damage the roots on those little plants. Maybe even to the point where you see some uh, plants clipped off towards the soil surface. Could be from a grub, could be from a cutworm. But regardless, you know, about 10 days after that field is planted, you're probably gonna start seeing the effects of some grubs. Again, if you have a non-grass crop before that, that's going to help. Um, some tillage, pre-plant application of some registered insecticides. Again, seed-treated insecticides work quite well. You can have some inferro stuff. So if you're doing some application to try to take care of the wireworms, the ants, you're probably going to catch the grubs as well. So a lot of those little management practices will work all the way through. So a quick little story. Everybody loves the story, right? Well, I've got a story to tell. So one of my first examples of a true insect issue would be grower in South Dakota, has a feed lot, applies a lot of manure, had corn in the field the year prior, lots of organic matter, organic matter, organic matter, organic matter. Gets out there, plants his sorghum seed, get a call from the local guy, says, hey, we got a stand failure, go ahead and replant it. Get it replanted. Um, week later, I get another call. Hey, something's going on out in this field. We're having issues again. You need to come out here and take a look. So I get out there taking a look at this crop. I have plants that are seven, eight inches tall. I have seedlings that are just coming out of the ground. The, the stand is really scattered because we have the first planting and we replanted into it. And now we have an issue again. I probably spent two hours out there trying to find the problem. I left that place that day with my head between my legs, uh, or tail between my legs, just kind of down that I would, did not figure out the silver bullet, what's going on. So I stopped, asked Mr. Google, most common sorghum pests, seedling pests, ants, wireworms, grubs. Boom, light bulb comes on. Jeff, while you're in that field, you saw an overabundance of ants in that organic matter. You also saw some wireworms. You also saw some grubs, and it was a compounding factor of all three insects in that field. Came back a third time, uh, replanted it with cruiser treated seed, beautiful stand. Guy calls me at the end of the year, says we've got a problem. You know how that goes, your gut just sinks, we've got a problem. He's like, yep, you're costing me money every time I talk to you, and I'm like, oh. He had to go buy another silage bag because he had too much feed. They wouldn't fit in the pile and he need, yeah, so it lasted him two years. So moral of the story is sometimes you might be in an area where you don't think you're going to have trouble, but if you take some of those 
opportunities uh, for you know organic matter, grass crop previous, maybe not as, as much tillage as you need, and no treated seed from that example. The guy doesn't plant uh, sorghum seed today without cruiser on it. Been a very good customer for five or six years, but we figured out what's going on with his farm situations in that area. So just kind of a fun little story to talk about some of those insects, I guess. So I didn't go through all the insects. We're going to catch on a few more here in a second, but you do have multiple modes of control. Again, we can still use airplanes. We'd love to see ground rigs when we can, just simply from the standpoint that we get great coverage, more gallons per acre. So then we switch into the ground rig situation. There are some examples where you can successfully do some control through chemigation. Again, you're gonna know your state's restrictions, uh, your abilities with your growers, how effective those things are for you and your environment. Throwing that out there for you to know that those things are options. Uh, seed treatments are available as well. Wow, that went fast. Sorry about that. So aerial ground rigs, chemigation, seed treatments, infertile applications as well. So I'm going to start just a little bit with the opportunities that we have here um, at Cropland. We do have options to have seed treatment. So applied on the seed as a coating uh, or seed um, seed coating applied treatment, along with a little bit of fungicide, a little bit of stored grain, um, insecticide to keep the, the grain bugs out. Um, and then your, uh, your seed applied insecticide. So, cruiser, <laughs> thiamoxoth, yeah, thiamoxoth methoxum. I, I having trouble with pronunciation today. Your nipsid and gaucho. So those are the three most common trade names that you're gonna see on seed as a seed treatment. And we primarily just run the gamut with cruiser. Um, so you would have a, concept plus cruiser seed treatment option if you're talking about the cropland brand other companies might use different products if you're sourcing your sorghum seeds from somewhere else but we do have those seed treatment options and they have worked quite well now generally those those treatments are going to last you three four five maybe up to six weeks of effective control and then as our plants get bigger we're going to uh, dilute that effect in those plants and we're not gonna have quite the control, but as far as a seedling control and early plant stages of development, we do very, very good from a seed applied treatment standpoint. So some of the foliar applied options and as Christy alluded to earlier, you know, we provide you guys with this great crop protection guide from uh, Winfield United. I just threw part of a, the page listing in here is an example. We are certainly not going to go through all the details of all the chemistries, which bugs they control, which ones are effective, which rate. Again, we all have resource material for that. But things I want you to be cognizant of is that many of these chemistries are not specific to certain insect species, right? It's uh, They might not be as effective on some different insects, but as we're out there with these foliars, we do have these beneficials out there that do a great job. And you know, I did not have that in my list earlier of insect pest control, but we do have some, some very good beneficials that help us in our reducing the impact of harmful insects to the sorghum crop. So again, as if we're out there and we're doing some applications, again, we're gonna, impact the beneficials, we're gonna reduce those numbers, maybe even eliminate those numbers in certain fields. Those pests that are not controlled by that chemistry and or are very well controlled by natural enemies, those colonies can reinfest and take off and explode quite quickly because we don't have that natural pest intervention out there. So just be conscious what products you do use. And uh, you know, at Atlanta Lakes, we have this soft spot for honeybees as well. So take care of the bees. Um, and again, something to be aware of as we're talking in my world, all forage crops, we need to be aware of this pre-harvest interval. Uh, make sure you're using the, using the right rate based on when you plan to harvest or graze those crops. And uh, those are timings and pre-harvest intervals are all listed in your 
crop protection guides and the labels that you can refer back to. So with that being said, we want to just be mindful of everything that's going on there as well. So I did highlight sugarcane aphids on this list, um, primarily because they have been a big issue. They've been all over the, the media and the news down in the South, especially. They really started bumping into our whole world there uh, as far as forage sorghum and sorghums and the, the detriment they provide back in 2013. So it's been about seven years. By 2015, there were some varieties that were starting to show up in the industry. But again, let's talk just a little bit about this sugar, this yellow sugarcane aphid biology. As many aphids are, these, these things are all females. They're born, the, all the females are ready to give birth to live young, right? So these things can rapidly multiply and go quickly. So again, they can develop into adults in five days. They might live as an adult up to four weeks. So if we're having young that are reproduced and we're already pregnant and we can just keep multiplying that thing every so many days, again, we can rapidly go quite quick. And as these colonies start to get crowded due to ideal moisture, temperatures, uh, maybe there's a lack of natural predators or pests out there, they can get overpopulated. Once they get overpopulated and crowded, we have some adults that develop wings. They don't generally move very far on their own, but as we get a light breeze or a wind, um, these things get up in the wind with their wings and away they go, and these colonies can spread. Now, most all of this uh, issue overwinters in the deep south. So part of this note is if we could have some better enhanced control in the south, um, maybe we can help reduce the potential for some of these insects to migrate. And I, I would say as we get better at managing this pest and scouting and understanding how it moves and where it lives and what it does and, and keeping these natural enemies out there, we potentially could see a decline um, and or an evolution in, in how much pressure these sugarcane aphids bring to us. So a little bit on the identification here, if you get under your magnifying glass, they're gonna have these little dark caruncles. The tips of their feet are gonna be dark. They do not have a dark head, but they do have antennal dark. So you're gonna see these little dark tips all over. They're gonna have antennas, the caruncles, and the tips of their feet are all gonna be black tipped. So as you get a, a magnifying glass out there, or as you are getting more comfortable identifying yellow sugarcane aphids on this sorghum crop, it just becomes pretty easy. And you flip a leaf over and you're like, yep, yeah, we've got sugarcane aphids, beware. So 13 was the big year. Again, they're gonna colonize on the bottom side of those leaves. So as you walk by the plants, you might not see them visually on top of leaves unless you're seeing dead um, aphids that have fallen from a leaf below. So you're gonna look for, excuse me, you're gonna look for those colonies on the underside of those leaves. And as you walk by in picture one on the left, you can see that that leaf has a little bit of shine to it. That's what's gonna catch your eye as you're walking through on an early infestation. You're gonna say, oh, there's a little honeydew. Flip the leaf above it up. You're gonna see these aphid populations on the underside of the leaf above that. And then as time goes on and uh, warm, you get weather in there, you get a little bit of this, oh, dark mold that starts to grow on top of those leaves. Um, so as those infestations get heavier, there's going to be more honeydew drop, the mold starts to grow, then we start shutting down chlorophyll and uh, photosynthesis. So that's generally what causes most of our yield and harvestability issues with sugarcane aphid is we shut down photosynthesis, we start shutting down the plant, as we get that honeydew on there, it's very sticky. And we've had guys running choppers that get a little bit crabby about, you know, plugging up the chopper. They've got to continually wash things out. So the, the best that we can do to control sugarcane aphids, uh, or the more we can do, the better our yields, the harvest, all of that just goes hand in hand. So 
generally we don't see a lot of trouble once they get up in the head area because forage sorghum is not generally grown specifically for seed production and we get um, a small amount of value from that head compared to a grain sorghum production where we're very very diligent about protecting grain yield we're in forage sorghum it's more about keeping photosynthesis going so that plant doesn't senesce too quickly and uh, keeping that sticky honeydew off so we can harvest it well. So that's a little bit about what those sugarcane aphids do to those plants. So again, sugarcane uh, aphid foliar application, basically in the industry, the two products that are the most effective are gonna be your Savanto and your Transform chemistries. So that's what most people have been using. I put a little note over here in the beginning. Those are the two that were introduced for control. There were some, uh, some exceptions made in the past. There has been some work done. It's not been approved yet, but there's a, a Savanto HL that's a higher concentration that they're trying to get introduced or released to uh, potentially do an inferno application, which there have been some studies done. It does seem to have a good benefit to sugarcane aphid um, suppression on sorghum. So that's to be looked for. And then there's a product from B BASF that's on the table right now called Safina. And, and that has a potential release as well. And the latest news I got was it's out there. Uh, it's being talked about, but it has not been released yet. So stay tuned. But again, this is just an example of some of the uh, you know, pre-harvest interval information, um, minimum, ap minimum application volumes and some restrictions to be aware of with those chemistries. So again, we talk about, um, and you've all heard about it, I'm sure if you're, if you're privy to the sorghum world at all, that there's been some, some resistance breeding going on out there. And there are basically three functional categories that they've categorized. And so you have antibiosis, which is basically where the plant host has an, an adverse effect on the biology of that aphid. And really just overall, it's, it's uh, decreasing the reproduction rate and the growth and survival of those aphids. So it's not 100% silver bullet. Antibiosis seems to be working quite well in certain varieties today. And then you have the second mode would be antizenosis. And basically this is the lack of preference to that host plant. Now, is it a morphological piece or a chemical factor within that plant? They're still really kind of trying to work through some of that with these sorghum varieties because there are some varieties that will have antibiosis um, characteristics, other varieties that have antizenosis characteristics. Some of them might, you know, appear to have both. Um, and then there's just a, a complete number three would be tolerance. And that would be that the plant still gets a fairly heavy infestation of sugarcane aphids, but it's a stronger, more robust, healthier plant that can just kind of tough its way through it and, and, and still survive and live because it does not have a preferential feeding and or mess up the biology. They colonize just like many others. So with that being said, there've been a lot of breeding efforts done in the last five years to try to get these three different pieces combined within these plants, um, identify who has what, what we can get by with, which crosses make good products for us to take to the field. And uh, the interesting thing is I believe I've seen the effects of all three of these on different plant hosts, um, different varieties. So pretty interesting, really neat to see. And I'm gonna just throw this out there. Cropland does have some options today. So we have a conventional single cut forage sorghum, gonna be in that 107, 110 day relative maturity range. We call it Aphex 3681. It's a conventional product. As we go through those pieces, I believe this is one that shows more insect tolerance because as we do evaluations, we actually see there are times where we get pretty heavy colonies on this thing. We see some honeydew. 
we might see some black soot, but that plant just is tough and robust and just works its way through the issues that it has. And uh, so the variety next to it might have a little higher population, um, but we have seen significant numbers on this product, but it's just tough, it just makes it right through. So again, very, very stress tolerant, and we'll see how these things evolve. And I've been able to evaluate this thing for three seasons now. This year we introduced it in our lineup as a conventional variety for anybody in those areas to, to have that um, protection. Then we go to our sorghum by sedan side. So this year we introduced a Brachitic Dwarf BMR. Or actually, it was introduced in 2019 for, for planting in 2020. We called it 1741 last year. This year I renamed it to, to Aphex Guardian because we're going to guard that plant. And if you look at these photos and blow them up on your screen just a little bit, sorry, I wanted to show them both. The plant on the top is the aphid tolerant variety that we have released called Guardian. The product on the bottom is our non-tolerant product in our lineup called 1731. Same types of genetics, same breeding program, but you can see significant uh, infestation or colonization on the non-tolerant product. And if you had to ask me today, I'm going to tell you this appears to be a little bit of a combination of, of the antibiosis and the antizenosis to where it's affecting the colonization potential of those aphids, whether it's preferential feeding and or um, reproductive disruption with the other side. Uh, a little bit of a combination there. So been a tremendous improvement for us. Uh, so those people that were used to taking multi-cuttings of a Brachitic Dorf BMR sorghum sedan in the past and having that second cutting absolutely destroyed by aphids, now we have a really, really nice opportunity out there to, to I'm going to call it, make hay like we used to before this insect became a problem and get right back after that second cut and not worry about that late season infestation. We also have the Economy brand. If anybody recognizes Honey Sweet, that's our Economy conventional sorghum sedan. And we also have it available with the uh, sugarcane aphid um, tolerance in that product as well. I cheated a little bit. I used the same picture as some of you might have picked up on, but it's that same principle where we're having less colonization and sugarcane aphid control on those products. The next option would be, again, and this one's going to fall into that anti-xenosis, antibiosis platform for sure. Probably a non-preferenced host here. So the pearl millets are basically known as being sugarcane aphid resistant. Um, again, I like to use the word tolerance because the word resistance means you absolutely never find anything and it's never going to have an impact. But the pearl millets that we do offer as well have sugarcane aphid um, properties. So we don't have to worry about those hay products being destroyed with an infestation of um, sugarcane aphids. And then again, a conventional option versus a BMR option for pearl millets. So just a quick run through on that piece. Management tips. So insect management tips. We went through some of that with our ants, white grubs, wireworms, early part when we were talking about some of those uh, more typical forage sorghum bugs. As we start looking at uh, yellow sugarcane aphids, one of the big things is, is plant it as early as you can in a warm soil, 60 degrees or warmer, so you get good germination and vigor, but also maybe an earlier variety so you can get it planted early, get it harvested a little bit quicker because we have a tendency to have a hard colonization of sugarcane aphids in the fall. So as I'm checking scouting fields, we start to see them coming uh, to a large effect through most of your geographies. And again, people on the call, it's going to be the guys in the south probably. But we're going to see those in August. And they start flaring up if they're going to stick around 
you know, 20th, 25th, towards the end of August. And then we start to really get a nasty effect in the first couple of weeks of September. So if we can plant a short variety, get stuff going, get it harvested early and just kind of avoid them, that's awesome. Insecticidal seed treatments, we have it available. Please keep it on your notes to contact me as soon as possible because we treat seed in, in February. Got that message? Okay, February. Scout early, scout often. Beneficial insects are awesome for, and we've seen them do a great job. So lady beetles, you go through some of these fields that are just full of lady beetles, surfed fly larvae, lace wings, parasitic wasps out there. I had sugarcane aphids at my place in Kansas City, Missouri this year. Left the plot go, BMR hybrid, they loved it. The insect pressure in there from beneficials was almost so crazy, I didn't even want to go in. It felt like a biology experiment on steroids. So they were doing their job, but we had a heavy infestation. Treat those aphids as the thresholds are released. Whether you're doing grain sorghum, forage sorghum, sorghum sedan, excuse me, depending on plant height, stage of maturity, there are different threshold recommendations so if you have that issue, maybe you already have that list printed, sit right on your desk or in your field guide that you carry in your truck. Just be aware of those as well. You know, use the effective insecticides. If you were to go into sugarcane aphids and spray a pyrethroid, you're going to kill all the beneficials. And it's almost like you added a steroid for sugarcane aphids. It's kind of like um, spider mites in different parts of the country. If you're not on top of your chemistry game, you can have a flare up and have the biggest problem you've ever seen. So be conscious of what you're picking from a labeled um, insecticide. And then again, consider your varieties with resistance and some tolerances. Again, I prefer to use tolerances as we go through some of that. But um, folks, again, if you have some questions that you have for us, um, for some reason, where I'm at right now, I'm not seeing any chat questions, but technically from a, from a pest management piece on sorghums today, um, that's what I have. So if we want to continue with any of those questions or the Q&A thing, um, have your poll questions popped up here, then we can certainly do that. So anybody have anything here, uh, go ahead. I'm I'm wrapped up with some, some sorghum pests at the moment. Yeah, Jeff, I'll go ahead and ask a couple questions while everyone's working on those poll questions. Um, so are you or anyone working on shorter season forage sorghums so we can harvest sooner and avoid the flush of sugarcane aphids in the late summer or fall? So yeah, that's a good question. I tell you, we have been keeping our eye on earlier season material all the way along so yes um well my brain just went haywire so we've been we've been watching those things what we're running up against right now is as we try to get things that grow quicker faster uh they have a tendency to have weak legs so for that double crop scenario and or this whole short season discussion you know, we've tried a few things. We have 3211 in the lineup today. If we plant it too thick, fertilize too heavy, water too much, it goes jungle grass crazy on the West Coast and it falls down. So to, to directly answer your question, absolutely. People are continuing to work on these earlier varieties to get through that. We just haven't found, to me, um, the right thing to bring in there that just feels perfect but yeah we're continually keeping our eyes on that and today we've we're trying to move you know uh so 3211 3212 is coming in the future a little better standability um that's at about 90 days there's some stuff out there we're looking really hard at 95 days to get things bumped up so yes we are looking it's coming it's just a slow process Sometimes they don't work out well. So you start over, look for another batch. It's great to hear we're always trying to look for new varieties though. 
So one other question before we jump into those poll questions, so make sure you're getting your answers in there. Um, why do you choose Cruiser over Nipsit on seed treatment of the sorghum in the cropland lineup? Yep, so, so we've went both ways. Sorry, I got an itch on my foot. We went both ways. Um, primarily, it's a, it's which is easy, and, and we have a, a good relationship with the distributor for Cruiser. It's easy. Um, it's not a product preference based on efficacy. So if anybody gets any Nipsid treated seed, we have used that in the past. It's not an inferior product. But through the seed treatment plants that we use, Cruiser's the preferred product in those plants. It's it's all about operations. It has nothing to do with efficacy. So mm -hmm. if anybody sees that maybe you've ordered Nipsid in the past or there's some carryover units with Nipsid, but everything else new has Cruiser on it, that's it's operational, just to be clear. Great. Since you're the next speaker, I'm going to let you answer this last question that's in our Q&A. Uh, do we have a replacement product for Rocket in the works where we can make dry hay? <laughs> Don't have to answer that. <laughs> uh, so Rocket. It'll be, it'll, I think it's going to be more exciting than Rocket. So yes, I'm excited to answer the question, but I'm also depressed at the same time. In our earlier discussions this year, we had a product, uh, excuse me, a product that we discussed called uh, Dynamic. So Rocket is a Sudan by Sudan, BMR, brachitic product that has pretty fine stem, worked really well. Those Sudans are hard to get produced and get clean to our specifications. And just to be transparent with everybody on the phone here today, when we would go to clean that, we would clean out nearly 30% to get it to the quality standards we want for you as a customer. So it, it, it's really hard to get done and not have it be too expensive. So the just dynamic product that I'm talking about is a sorghum sedan cross. So it has a little bit more of that yield potential with the, the, the Ford sorghum component in there, Brachitic Dorf. BMR, photo period sensitive. So it covers all three acronyms. I watched it all summer, excited as you would, could imagine. Get a phone call in November, seed quality is no good coming out of Texas. Got froze before it was harvested in that early frost and snow that went through there. We're not gonna know if the seed quality is any good for sure. We're gonna wait till February, do some seed treatments, see if the germ stays good. We might have some available this year, we might not. The good news is yes, I am so excited about that thing from a leafy tillering monster, it's crazy. So excited, but again, here I am telling you, I got this piece of candy, can't have it. We're gonna hold on to it, so. It's coming. There's some rocket in the system right now. If you've got to have some for 2021 planting, it's a little on the lower germ side, tagged at 75%. Test came back at 80, so it should be pretty good, but we tagged it at 75, just so you know. Sounds great, Jeff. Why don't you go ahead and go over the poll question and then go ahead and move on to your next presentation after that and just going to finish up the day for us. Yeah, that'll be that'll be great. So, how many different ways can sorghum develop tolerance or resistance to sugarcane aphids? So, really, the the answer that I was expecting would be three different ways, and that would come off the slide being anti-xenosis, antibiosis, and just tolerating stress and pressure. So, technically, the resistance I probably tricked to somebody in there because then I said there's no true resistance, but I have the word tolerance. So. You answered the question wrong. I apologize. I, as I'm looking at this, you know how this sometimes live TV makes more sense. Ants can be a pest problem for sorghum. Yeah, somebody answered that one a little bit off, but yes, they can be a problem for sorghum. Um, what chemical is used in the seed treatment that we call Cruiser? Yeah, most of you got that correct. So glufosinate is a crop protection chemical. Chlorpyrifos would be your uh, Lorsban type material. So that would be false. 
Uh, so C is the correct answer. And I can't pronounce that word for some reason today, but that's the cruiser component that was on the slide earlier. Thank you all for participating. And those of you that were playing around with social media and Facebook, you missed a couple, sorry. <laughs> all right, so we'll move on. Any, uh, any thoughts or comments before I actually do that? So we have panelists that have availability to say something. Um, you know, that goes right down through the DSM. Do you guys have anything to add about that piece before we talk a little bit about these alternative strategies and different forages to use? Okay, everybody's good with that. Perfect. Sometimes you don't know whether that's good, there's no questions or bad, but here we go. Alternative forage strategies. So I put this slide deck together to use for guys that are, you know, primarily doing this corn soybean thing. Maybe they're just corn silage alfalfa focused and that's where their world concentrates on. So why would we consider some of these other alternatives for forages and what are some of the strategies that go around that? Why do we do what we do? So reasons for alternatives. Not limited to this set of questions or uh, bullet points, but good place to start. Corn and corn silage are just getting too expensive to feed. Maybe they're getting too expensive to grow. Maybe you don't have enough water to grow a full corn crop on all your acres. I understand where you guys are coming from out there. Water's an issue. Emergency forage needs. Depending on where you're at, what the geography is, I could, I could list 10 different reasons for different geographies in the world. I actually had to change this because I was Midwestern based earlier. And it was all about, you know, emergency. What if your alfalfa dies from frost? Well, some of you might have some freezing, heaving, other issues that kill an alfalfa stand. You need emergency feed. We got to have feed now. What can we grow quickly in a warm season and get some feed as soon as possible? Maybe all of a sudden you have too many cows, too many feeders. For some reason you lost some pasture. Maybe you lost some crop ground. Things happen all over the place that we need alternative forages at the last minute for an emergency to get by. Maybe you're looking at soil health objectives. Some of these alternative crops have been used as cover crops. But we can still utilize them as feed sources and a great source of dry matter for one reason or another. Something else I threw in here for uh, this geography basically is nematode suppression with some of these sorghum varieties or sorghum types. Basically, we're going to produce, you know, hydrogen cyanide gas coming off of those roots and plant parts that could potentially kill and suppress uh, nematodes. So all of these different reasons come into play. Why would we consider alternative forages for a forage crop? Next thing would be is if we can help them build a forage system utilizing multiple crops. And I, I started this, I don't know, probably seven, eight, maybe even nine, ten years ago, where we started looking at taking corn silage off. Uh, top scenario as we look at this. So started with corn silage, we took corn silage off. There's a break, we put some manure down. As we get into these dairy operations, maybe a the confined feedlot operations where we have lagoon manure, maybe it's hogs, maybe it's poultry, could be any of these. If they were trying to raise uh, either a corn crop or a silage crop, feed of some kind, but we have a break. We get an opportunity to put manure down. In this example, I threw winter wheat, you could do fall rye, triticale, but you get your corn silage off, put manure down, put your fall crop in, grow that over the winter. Harvest it in the spring, you got another break out here. Put some more manure down. Maybe we've taken that off in June, or depending on where you're at geographically, your, uh, your timing will be different than what's stuck in my brain. Get your winter, winter crop off, put manure down, follow up with forage sorghum. It's a great break in the rotation. It's not a host for corn rootworm if you're in that part of the world. Some of the other corn insects, some of the corn diseases it's not a host for, um, but it also gives you another value priced warm season crop to grow during the heat of the summer where it loves heat, it doesn't take a lot of water, 
you know, all these things have a, a benefit to it. So we come off of, we come off of our forage sorghum, we chop that, we get some more manure applied, we go back to a cover crop or rye, winter wheat, whatever, triticale to go over the winter. Again, you've got your forage system built around an alternative forage. Maybe you start in the spring, you did not have a fall forage planted, you can drop in some oats, a spring wheat, something that's fast growing in those cool conditions that you can get started right away, chop it, hay it, take whatever you need for feed, get your manure break, get your forage sorghum or warm season annual as I'm gonna put it here. Then we bounce into another uh, manure application. We go to our cover crop or our winter annual, uh, winter wheat, triticale, rye again, manure break, back to corn silage, maybe it's forage sorghum. But again, there are all these options to set up a forage system that utilizes beneficial pieces of these warm season annual uh, crops. Again, cover crop graze, go to pasture, put your forage sorghum in. You're gonna graze your forage sorghum and go to pasture. This is a rotational deal for a guy that might be pasturing cows. You're gonna graze some sorghum for a while, go back to the pasture, come back to the sorghum, let the pasture rest, you know, back and forth, rotational grazing type scenarios. Works really great, but again, it's fun to be able to lay these things out there so it stirs the thought process. And as you're talking with some of your growers or people that you work with, maybe some of you are raising cows at home or doing some dairy business, it, 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 you take that stuff back with you. So then again, I throw this in, what are my options? You've got forage sorghums in the middle. That would also contain sorghum sedans, pearl millets, sedan grass. But you have these guys out here, winter wheat, tree to kale, other warm season annuals, maybe it's teff grass for somebody, peas and oats mix, these cover crop mixes, you got barley in different places, Italian ryegrass mixes. Once in a while, the forage guy gets this call about forage soybeans. Yeah, they're group eight things grown in Arkansas. That's what I can tell you. Call somebody that knows more about it. It's fun how interesting it is to get involved in all these forage questions but why why would we consider these uh, forage sorghum sorghum sedans maybe a pearl millet in these rotations to help us with our forage program first things first when we look at input cost versus a corn crop that could potentially fail and i think that's where the biggest example comes in is that you know to raise a corn crop it costs a lot of money and if you are limited on some resource, whether it be water or fertility or a combination of both, we have reduced input costs on seed, water, fertility, point blank. Less water requirements. As we get into these rotational acres where we might have the ability to grow forage sorghum on a certain pivot, give it half the water that you would normally put there for a corn crop and reallocate that water to another pivot or another corn crop to raise a solid corn crop on one acre and a solid forage sorghum or sorghum sedan warm season annual crop on another acre, you win. You have less input costs on one quarter. And you can make sure you get the revenue back out of the other one that you need to take care of a little bit more. So resource allocation, I'll call it there, especially on water. It's an excellent source of energy and fiber, digestible fiber. So it's not equal to corn from an energy standpoint, basically due to starch. But when we look at fiber digestibility and the efficiencies that those things can bring to us, they are great, great sources that help raise uh, meat and milk. We have yields that are very similar to corn. And if you get on those tougher marginal acres or have to sacrifice water or nutrients somewhere, we will out yield corn from a tonnage standpoint because we are, we love heat. We can grow on less moisture. We're more efficient with fertilizer. You just went all the way around from that particular standpoint. So things to think about. Now, this is going to be a little review for some of you, but I want to quickly go through some of the categories and break this down just really quickly on what some of these things are. So when we say forage sorghum, we're really talking about a single cut forage product that's going to be 
generally planted with a row unit. It works best to be run through a corn planter, sorghum plate or disc, singulated, um, moderate to low population. I'm gonna call that 60,000 to 80,000 plants per acre, depending on which variety you plant. By all means, pay attention to that too. It makes a difference, just like corn. But generally a single cut forage product um, grouped in three maturity categories, as we talked earlier, you're gonna be early, mid, or late. Basically late means full, full season. So just wanted to throw that out there because sometimes guys will call me and say, yeah, I need some feed. What's that mean? You want support sorghum? Well, I need some feed. Give me some cane. Now we gotta break this down a little bit. So available in different plant types, rachitic dwarf, uh, male sterile, combinations of that, BMRs, improved quality for better fiber digestibility. Yeah, that's what uh, your DSMs and I are here for to help you sort through that. Second thing would be this sorghum by sedan grass cross. And again, regionally, you'll get called all different things. Yeah, I need some feed, Jackson. What's happening? So then we break it down. Do you want to do multiple cuts, grassier style, have the opportunity to bale it for dry hay, do baleage, graze it, chop it. They're more versatile from that standpoint. So again, sedan, uh, sorghum sedan crosses, generally smaller stems for better dry down. Uh, we have a, a higher potential for faster regrowth than we do in a single cut system. That, that Heterosis and vigor that we get by crossing those two really helps us with uh, regrowth. Again, a smaller stem is going to help you for dry down. Again, if you're doing baleage or chopping it, that's not nearly as important as trying to make up dry hay, which if you're in an arid spot, works good. If you get those humid areas, like where I'm located here, and we talk about bags and piles. We don't talk about uh, <laughs> dry hay nearly as much when it's 85% all day long. Um, again, available as conventionals, brachitic dwarf, BMR, photoperiod sensitive, combinations of all those put together and we have that represented in our products. We'll help you walk through that. A few of them are listed here on the page. The sedan grasses, again, Jeff, we need some feed, we need some hay, what can we plant? Again, as we step away from a forage sorghum, Smaller stems, more leaf, to, uh, more leaf to stem ratio, might dry a little faster, great regrowth potential, lots of options in the market. The thing I will caution here is there aren't very many companies that have, uh, in my mind, significant really cool sedan grasses today, but that's my opinion. There are a few out there that can be utilized. I think I'm really hitting something with this Brachitic Dorf BMR photoperiod sensitive thing that I talked about earlier. So then we get into these pearl millets. We have had them available for quite some time. I believe our company's probably done maybe a lackluster job of agronomic advice and uh, getting those done correctly over time. What I really like about these pearl millets again is they're priced reasonable from a cost per acre standpoint. Very similar, almost dollar for dollar, the same as a sorghum sedan cross. Very flexible. We can plant them. Uh, they don't need a lot of moisture. They just need to get going, just like a Ford sorghum, sorghum sedan grass. High, high, high leaf to stem ratio. Leaves dry fast. Keep that in mind. So from a dry down standpoint, if you're looking for something to just be leafy and dry quickly, this might be the best way to go versus a sorghum sedan if you're looking to replace rocket from that question that was asked um, earlier. Um, extreme leafiness, yes. So again, really, really excited about these as an alternative forage to the way guys generally think. If, and if you're looking for something that uh, Forage quality wise, from a fiber digestibility, crude protein thing, 4611 leafy BMR pearl millet. I've seen in vitro total, total digestibilities on this thing be above 70s in the 80s. 
crude protein at 45 days touching 20 percent so extremely good they could fit into a lactating cow ration really well oh and by the way sugar cane aphid tolerant again throw that in there just for giggles right also have a conventional version beautiful green leafy healthy again high leaf to stem ratio dry fast alternative forage people are not used to 10 to 15 pounds three quarters of an inch deep do it with a good drill just like you're going to plant alfalfa almost uh, from a very good seed bed standpoint as we talk about preparing seed beds make sure you get that right cutting height six inches that's kind of the stickler but we need to get that good regrowth so six six inches would be optimal for a, a strategy to get the regrowth on a on a good pearl millet so for some reason i've got that slide in there again hope you all enjoyed it the first time get to see it a second time brachytic dwarf when we talk about brachytic dwarfs ladies and gentlemen what we're talking about is this shortening of inner node space to help get us a higher leaf to stem ratio so when you see a forage sorghum listed as 3531 brachytic dwarf bmr it means that it has a shortened inner node space as this picture on the uh, upper left would suggest it's just leaf 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 and as the picture on the right shows that's a brachytic dwarf bmr that's tillered well probably a little closer to the end of a plot or a row so you get to see the full exposure of what that thing does but they are just a leafy mess how do we get our yield out of these short, shorter brachytic dwarf plants we get a lot of stem density and we get a lot of leaves so don't always be fooled by these tall beautiful plants these short little guys can yield just as much we generally don't have standability issues we have an opportunity to go after those things as well. So anyway, brachytic dwarf, shortened inner nodes, made the short planter, plant shorter, excuse me. Um, out in the West where things have a tendency to be jungle grass and go crazy in California, these brachytic dwarfs stay manageable, don't fall down, produce great yield. BMR, for those of you that understand the BMR thing in the world, brown midrib, extra fiber digestibility, we got a lot of products with BMR in them. We believe in having the best digestible stuff out there. So BMR, high fiber digestibility, great efficiency, great gain, great milk production, all those kind of things come with BMR. There are oodles and oodles of information out there. This is a grazing study, a little bit dated, but just really cool to see that for grazing stockers in Texas, they picked up three tenths of a pound per head per day more by using a BMR than a conventional. So take that to a cow calf guy that's running calves or, or trying to feed, they get it. Three tenths of a pound makes a big deal. We always talk about doing data to insights here at Winfield United. I have a We've got the scenario here is the cheap conventional sorghum sedan versus a brachytic dwarf BMR. Improved fiber digestibility and quality. You can take this to the dairy if you need to, but this is really fun for the beef guy to look at if you're feeding cows somewhere. The seed price is almost, it's actually a little over double per bag. We're gonna plant the same rate. So we're gonna have double the cost per acre to plant it. At the end of the day, when we boil all this thing down on undigestible fiber, how many tons of beef we can, or how many pounds of beef we can produce per ton? Take that times tonnage, which is very similar. At the end of the day, per acre, we can raise more dollars worth of beef by planting a higher quality product. I joked around and told guys, you know, I could charge you an extra $1,100 a bag and you could break even on a $40, $80 bag of seed. Interesting how we have opportunities, even in an alternative forage market, to have very, very um, high yields of gain and or milk produced. So, um, yeah, I've got some varieties that are going to pop across there. Photo period sensitive. As we look at these alternative crops, we have photo period sensitive in our lineup, in our sorghum sedans, and um, 
Uh, just the sorghum sedan, excuse me, cross is not in the true forward sorghum, and we don't have photo period sensitive in the pearl millets. But that's out there. If they want a long season to grow, they don't know if they're going to get it cut at 40 days or 40 inches. It's just going to continue to get vegetated for a long period of time. Out until we get less than 12 hours and 20 minutes of daylight, then it's going to try to throw a head on. But you can see in here our old 1923, the old rocket was photo period sensitive. Uh, the new dynamic that I want to try to introduce, introduce again is photo period sensitive as well. So they'll grow for a long time. Just continue to put yield on. All right. A little bit about harvesting some of these alternative forages. If a guy wants the absolute best in fiber digestibility and crude protein, they need to take those at this lower bar. And a lot of you will understand when I say the flag leaf or the boot stage, that's where you're going to get your best quality. You're going to get good tons, great quality. Once that head starts to elongate and we go to grain formation, it's just like alfalfa. When it gets to that bud stage, it's really, really good. But once we start putting flowers on, getting mature, quality drops faster than the gain we get from tons. So by adding that little bit of head out there to me, uh, for a guy that wants a really good quality feed, I wouldn't even wait for a head. Swath it, chop it, swath it, dry it, whatever you're going to do, get it put in a pile, get it put in your storage pad, whatever it is. Those are a couple of considerations for uh, quality and yield. So I did a little comparison on cost-wise. This is a little bit old, but not horrible. Now you're all going to look at this and go, nobody sells a $180 bag of seed corn. That's too cheap. I know it. But I set it equal to a concept cruiser treated bag of the very best forward sorghum that we have at $180 a bag just to make the unit price the same. As we go down through this list, you guys can look at this. We'll share it again. You can have it later. At the end of the day, it's going to cost me $520 an acre to plant corn and raise corn. On sorghum side, 306 bucks. If we did a dry land scenario, about 228 without the irrigation and a little lower population, 139. You're probably sitting there going, Jeff, it costs more than that. It costs less than that. I get it. I put this together based on this South Dakota, Missouri, Iowa, Midwest production. So you can make that fit any way you want to. I get it. That's cool. As long as you understand. I, I know we're not in the same world. My point is, when you can look at a $250 or $150 cost per acre difference, and we are in a limited moisture or a limited resource situation, and we need an alternative forage to keep livestock going, we have some great opportunities in our, in our company. Um, in the worlds that you live in, obviously Cropland is not the only company that sells forages or alternative forages, but, but they're available and that's how we can look at some of that. So as we look at these, the advantages, seed input costs, these products win. Fertility costs, they win. Underperforming soils, <laughs> sorghum and pearl millet wins. Water use efficiency, again, they win. If you have one of those growers that needs this nematode reduction, these sorghums, sorghum sedan crosses, some different Sudan products have very, very good abilities of being green manure, plow down, organic matter pieces out there that can help reduce the nematode pressure you have in some of these uh, potentially vegetable growers, potato growers, and those guys that have those underground type fruits that you need to harvest you don't need that nematode damage out there so consider these and also just a scavenger from some nutrients down a little deeper so they do have some good penetrating root systems for compaction issues getting some nutrients recycled in the profile so again you can see that there are a lot of opportunities out there and we do have some alternative forage options and i hope i I hope I got you guys thinking a little bit more today. Maybe you took some notes, maybe you didn't. Uh, but I'm going to let her go at this point. Uh, just a few pictures from the summer. I had a little photo contest this year where we had 
approval from some guys. They sent in pictures of their kids out in the sorghum. And, and this guy actually with the two kids up here, I'm, I'm sending him a, a Christmas gift next week because he was my forage sorghum contest winner. So anybody has any questions? I think uh, we'll just move through now. I, I did not keep track of the, the clock. So I apologize if I'm getting you guys done quicker than you should be. And I apologize if I've nope. rambled longer. It's possible. Nope. Nope. You're good, Jeff. You're doing great on time-wise, actually. Um, so go ahead and answer the poll questions, everyone. We have a couple of questions for Jeff while you guys are answering the polls. So, Jeff, you must have sparked some interest because one of the questions is, is how sensitive to frost is a leafy pearl millet? Um, 32 degrees, gonna die. Uh, 32, yeah, so at 32 degrees, it's going to be just as sensitive as your sorghum sedan, your sedan grass, your Ford sorghum type products. You get close to 32 degrees, you're going to see some leaf damage to the top of the plant, depending on, you know, how, how much heat's held in the canopy, how long that temperature stays there. So again, it's going to die very similar to your other sorghum products to answer the question. Great. Uh, another question. Um, so can we do a pre-emergent chemistry on the pearl millet if we have growers looking to plant some? So I tell you what, the interesting thing about that is the pearl millet, we cannot get any of those concept type, soar pro type products to work on the, that seed. It is so sensitive every time they try to do a seed treatment to prevent damage, uh, we just don't have success with it. So realistically about the only thing you can use that I, and that's stretching my memory just a touch, but yet a light rate of atrazine, if it's approved where you're doing your practices and if you can handle that in your rotation, I think is probably the only pre-emerge piece that I can remember that we can use. So it's a little bit more get it planted, get it out of the ground, get it shade the rows. We're gonna we're gonna overcompete weeds instead of uh, trying to control it chemically. For the most part, pearl millet are a little bit tough. But weeds chop great. Too. <laughs> Perfect. And that answers the question. So we're going to take the polls down and we're going to let Jeff go over the answers of what you guys put in there. And then we'll turn it over to Christy to kind of end the presentation for the day. Yeah. So question number one that I that I provided for the group earlier. So which of these products does not have a prussic acid issue in grazing cattle? So, of course, I provided that question and then I'm pretty sure I had it in notes, but I did not technically say this as we went through it. So thank you for the 66% that, that answered A. Pearl millet generally does not have, excuse me, I shouldn't use the word generally. Pearl millet does not have a prussic acid, prussic acid problem when grazing cattle. Um, but the other two sorghum type products will have a degree of prussic acid, which again, is the uh, the catalyst the catalyst that turns into your hydrogen cyanide gas? So we don't want to do that if you're trying to graze sorghum sedans and it freezes. Question number two: Select the main reason why you consider an alternative forages in area of the west where corn silage. You know what? Uh, and and I I left that open to be multiple choice, and you could have chosen all all of them actually but of course b is the one that's a little bit sarcastic it just uh just sounds cool right but so we have water use efficiency great thanks for answering that that was the highest answered question reduce the rate of fertilizer i didn't talk about that quite as much and reduce your your seed input costs so looks like everybody really hit that one pretty good and a couple sarcastic guys like myself answer b in there with with the rest um, and then again, is uh, cereal rye is the only alternative forage we can grow? That should be false. Looks like everybody did a good job on the quiz today. So again, thank you all for participating.
I hope you all um, had a, a good experience and we've opened some thought processes. And again, if there are more chat questions that we need to go back through and answer, I'll be checking on those here in a few minutes. And uh, my phone's always on, email's open. Anybody needs any help, please let me know. I'd love to help you uh, raise some alternative forages on the West. So from the Forge Fanatic, signing out. Have a good day, y'all. Okay, Jeff, and don't leave us in case we get more questions and we'll have the, the last ones come up. And I did want to comment on an additional thought as far as an alternative forage and why you may want to highlight that. Uh, it's actually a good rotation in between alfalfa if you're just wanting to go out one year and you want to still have a feed that you can do and you can bale. So we've utilized the Green Treat Rocket as the one that we would do as the one of choice there. Um, another reason that I've done on kind of a, you get to the point of, I don't know what else to do with it and you figure you try it is actually kill everything off and make sure that it's just the green treat rocket and then put it out because you have such bad pocket gopher problems. And then if that's the only thing they have to eat, they eat a lot of prussic acid and it actually is quite effective at killing pocket gophers um, and reducing the population there. So that was another, I guess, a potential of a reason why you would wanna do it. Um, and as far as weed control, I would agree with Jeff on trying to make sure that you do your plan ahead for controlling your weeds like we would with alfalfa, but especially so with some of these alternative forages and make sure that you've cleaned it up first before you plant. If you're planting them in June when it's nice and warm and there's, uh, you know, say 65 degrees soil temperature. If you plant them then where they can get up and going fast and out compete the weeds, then that's definitely a good option. And then uh, potentially looking at like an LB6, you know, or uh, an option there as far as a 2,4-D that you could potentially use, but you have to wait till it gets bigger. So cultural management is definitely good and planning ahead on the forage side for alternative forages. Okay, so I do want to, before I close, I want to go back to Kyle and Bo um, in the beginning of where we started. Have you guys had any additional thoughts on anything to do with wheat that you think that we should cover before we end today? They're being quiet. Okay. Um, you know, I saw Katie several years ago when I started doing some of the stuff with variable rate and looking at what Bo was doing too. And so don't forget about making sure that you're utilizing the ag tech to help you and understand what's under the ground and, and with all of our crops that we can utilize that as far as the ag tech side. I've been able to look at fields in Nebraska and use the R7 tool and look at the soil maps and have a basic understanding to be able to answer the question. So don't forget to utilize that piece. 